Shalom Hadavarnix. Welcome to Hadavar Messianic Ministry School of Biblical and Jewish Studies. We're studying the Jewish life of the Messiah, the 2021 edition. We're in lesson three, and this is our 12th session together. So let's review where we were in session number 11. Uh, we looked at the response of the people in Nazareth, the Yeshua's claim to be the Messiah in Luke 4, 22. The response began very positively. There was approval. They were speaking well of him. But this um, speaking well of Yeshua then degenerated into wonder, wondering at the gracious words. You know, where did he get these words? Where did he get these concepts? This degenerated into doubt. Is, is not this Joseph's son? How can he possibly be the Messiah? We know his father, he's right here. This can't possibly be the Messiah. So this degenerated into rejection. Rejection, and I want you to note, one of the key areas uh, that caused this rejection is this thought, is this not Joseph's son? That's the misconception that everybody is, is working on. They think Yeshua is Joseph's son. Well, he's not, he's God's son. Joseph is not his father. Joseph is not his stepfather. Joseph has, has not adopted him. He's God's son. Joseph is his, is his guardian and his guardian only. And so he can't be the Messiah because we know who his father is and we know he came from Nazareth. You know, he lives here in Nazareth. So a number of reasons why they choose to reject him. Now, the principle we, we encountered here is what happens locally and on a small scale in Nazareth will happen on a large scale nationwide. So keep, keep your eye open for this principle. So they take him to the edge of a cliff, and this is the uh, edge of the cliff uh, for Upper Galilee. You can see the Jezreel Valley down below. And there are plenty of opportunities along this mountainous area to toss somebody down the hill and have them suffer fatal injuries. So they tried to toss him over the cliff. Instead, he just walked through them and went on his way. And that brings us to the new material. Uh, section 46, the move to Capernaum. And so he goes on his way and leaving Nazareth because of the rejection, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zeb uh, Zebulun and Naphtali. And this was to, fill, to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. And the quote, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. So due to this rejection, he sets up a new headquarters in a new city. And here are the two cities. There's Nazareth and there's Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a trade city. It was, it's a very strategic city. It was located along the Via Maris, V-I-A-M-A-R-I-S, the way of the sea, the Via Maris. This was the most famous trade route in the area. And this is a fulfillment of prophecy, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, because Nazareth uh, resides in the territory, the tribal territory of Zebulun, and Capernaum resides in the tribal ter territory of Naphtali. And so when Yeshua moved his headquarters from Nazareth to Capernaum, he was moving from one tribal area to another tribal area and fulfilling the prophecy. And when we look at our four types of prophecy, our four interpretive techniques, we see that this is a Peshat. Remember, a Peshat is the plain sense, the literal sense. And this is a literal prophecy plus a literal fulfillment. He, it was said he would move from one tribal territory to another, and Jesus did move from one tribal territory to another. All right, well, let's move on then to section 47 and the first call of the four. This is covered in Matthew and Mark. We're in lesson three, page 37 in the middle of the page. He's gonna call Peter, Andrew, James, and John. So let's pick it up in chapter four of Matthew, verse 18. Now, as Yeshua was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat 
and their father and followed him. So here's a couple of maps of where Yeshua was uh, walking. Here is the Sea of Galilee. And of course, Capernaum is his new headquarters. And Bethsaida is the home of, of Peter, for example. Andrew and Peter, and here is a, a map uh, of the area. Here's Capernaum. And so he's walking along the seashore over toward Bethsaida in that area, and he calls these men to, uh, to ministry. Now, this, this decision of these men did not come out of the blue. Their initial exposure to Jesus had come two or three months earlier in section 31. So they were men prepared and primed for the call of God in their lives. They were ready to go when the call came. And I think God will do the same for you too. He'll prepare you for your calling and when you're, when you're ready, you'll know it when you're ready to go. Now, we'll soon see that this appears to be a call to part-time service. So this move is from 100% secular work, fishing, to part-time service. So it's a gradual um, removal from their standard way of making a living. <clears throat> now we come to section 48. Teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum, authenticated by healing a demoniac, covered by Mark and Luke. We're in lesson three, page 37 in the middle of the page. Now there's a big debate going on. The debate, the debate centers around Yeshua's authority. Where did he get the authority to say these words that he says and to perform the wonders, the miracles that he performs? And so let's pick it up in Mark chapter one, chapter one, verse 21 and 22. They went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Okay, the location of the incident then is in the synagogue. And here is modern Capernaum. This is the remains of what's called the White Synagogue at modern Capernaum today. So you can visit this scene. Here's a picture I took from the south and uh, west side of the front. And this is a direct frontal shot. You can see the black basalt stones that make up the homes of, of Capernaum in the foreground. Now our guide, Gila, is pointing to a sign on the white, on the white uh, synagogue. So let's take a close up of that sign. It says, the late fourth century AD white synagogue built upon the remains of the synagogue of Jesus. And so the white synagogue it was not there when Jesus was teaching in, in uh, Capernaum, uh, but it sits on the foundation of the synagogue that was erected at that time. And you can see the black basalt foundation of Yeshua's synagogue. So the location is correct. It's just that Yeshua uh, is, um, these, this new synagogue was built on the floor that Yeshua actually walked on. So as you go inside the modern uh, synagogue, this is probably very similar to the way it looked in Yeshua's day, except this floor is one level too high. Yeshua walked on the, on the floor level below this white synagogue, below the white synagogue. So that's the location of the incident. And it's an, he's teaching in a new manner. He's teaching with independent th authority. He's not citing any other authority. And this is a key issue. This is a key issue. From the rabbinic commentary on the New Testament, Rabbi Samuel Tobias Locks uh, shares some insights with us. He's, he writes, the crowds were used to the type of preaching which characterized the scribes Pharisees. Their procedure was to teach the oral law by citing the authorities from whom the speaker received the traditions being transmitted. Failure to do so was considered not only a display of arrogance, but destructive of the system, breaking the continuum of the process. This is emphasized by the statement, anyone who says a thing in the name of the one who said it brings deliverance to the world. In other words, that's a very, very positive uh, method of teaching. And then it's justified by Esther 2.22, as it had said, and Esther told it in the name of Mordecai. Jesus' presentation appeared strange to the people who were accustomed to hearing the citations together with the tradition taught. Jesus appealed to no such authority in his teaching, neither by name nor by inference. Daub notes, 
The contrast between to teach with authority and to teach like the scribes is a crux to this day. It's an issue to this day. The scribes, if we identify them with the leading rabbis of the time, were held in the highest esteem. Oh, very high esteem. The people were surprised that Jesus should teach like one ordained, because Yeshua was not ordained at any rabbinical academy. And then Rabbi Avigdor Miller, in his book Rejoice, O Youth, gives us a look at the level to which the sages were esteemed. He says, after the destruction of the sanctuary, the special presence of God, which once dwelt in the Holy of Holies, now rests on the sages who teach the Torah to disciples. So in modern days, even the special presence of God is, is um, on any sage. I guess a, a sage, though, wouldn't be a modern day person. But anyway, you see the, how high these sages were held in esteem. They were the very, the, the very special presence of God dwelt on them. Now he goes further, he says, even when the divine presence dwelt in the sanctuary, even when the temple was uh, in operation and, and built, it was only because of the Torah sages. They are the bond between God and Israel because they bear the, bear the oral tradition by which God made his covenant with us. Notice he's talking about the oral tradition there, the Mishnah. He's not talking about the written tradition. Any form of contact with the sages and of support of the sages is tantamount to contact with God. It's the same as contact with God. So you can see how high the sages were esteemed, far above what is proper for a human being. All right, let's move on to verses 23 and 24. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do you have? Do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Well, the people in Capernaum might not recognize his authority. The people in Nazareth surely didn't recognize this authority, but the demons recognize his authority. It is spirit authority, it is authority from God. He is the Holy One. Verse 25, and Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet, come out of him. Throwing him into a convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed so that they debated among themselves. Here the debate continues. What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So we have a new kind of teaching and new methods of casting out demons, which is validating the teaching. So we're gonna discuss this later, we'll discuss this later. But the key thing to note is at this point in time, his authority is being hotly debated. Verse 28, immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. So the response is widespread word of mouth response. Uh, discussions going on, buzz is going on. Have you heard about this guy, Jesus, Yeshua, from Nazareth who's doing wonders and teaching without authority in Capernaum. Must have been quite a, quite a subject for many people. All right, let's move on to section 49. Peter's mother-in-law and others healed, covered by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is lesson three, page 37 at the bottom of the page. We'll pick it up in verse 29. And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So following the synagogue service, Jewish people gather for a Shabbat meal in their homes. And so Jesus went to Peter's home, which is literally a stone's throw away. Now here's first century Capernaum, and let's jump in a time machine and let's transfer to modern Capernaum. This is what you'll see when you visit Capernaum today. And here is Peter's house. Now that doesn't look like Peter's house, does it? No, it is a modern church built over the location of Peter's house in order to protect it and sanctify it. Uh, it floats over uh, Peter's house on huge arches. And so I call it the Church of the Flying Saucer. I think it looks more like a flying saucer. Now, before that church was built, this is a picture on a postcard that was taken long before that church was built. And you can see the remains of the octagonal church that was originally built over Peter's home. See this octagonal church? Let's go in for a close up on that postcard. There is the octagonal church. And here is a close up picture of that structure before it was covered over. 
Now, if you go to Capernaum today, you'll see the Church of the Holy uh, Church of the uh, uh, Flying Saucer sitting over that location. And here I'm I'm standing at the synagogue with my back to the synagogue, and I'm just looking across Capernaum there, just to give you some kind of an idea of the Church of the Flying Saucer. I should have taken a picture of that church uh, itself, but you can you can see here some of the archwork the foundations that hold that building floating over Peter's home. So let's go to Peter's home. Here we're looking, peeking under the Church of the Flying Saucer. And there you can see the white uh, stone construction of the octagonal church. And here you can see not only the white uh, construction of the octagonal church, but you can see the first century basalt layer, the black basalt layer underneath it. And here's a close-up of it. That is the layer of Peter's day. Those stones may have felt the touch of Peter's hands or the touch of Yeshua's hands. That's the first century layer. And this is a uh, archaeologist's rendition of Peter's home built upon the archaeological remains that have been found. And the octagonal church was built something like that around Peter's house something like that. It's just a small little room, really. It wasn't very big. And this drawing is also based on the archaeological discoveries made at Capernaum. And if you look at this home and compare it to the previous drawings, you'll see that they're probably drawing Peter's home here. This is probably Peter's home. The location looks right and the shape of the home, all the details around it look right. So that looks like Peter's home to me. And now if you go into the Church of the Flying Saucer, you'll see a large window built into the middle of the church. It's a very pretty church, as you can see. Looking down through that window, you can look upon the uh, later white, uh, white construction of the octagonal church, and then you can also see the black basalt layer. That was the layer in the first century. So that's Peter's home. Okay, let's jump back in our time machine and go back to the first century Capernaum. In first century Capernaum, then there is the synagogue. We call it the Black Basalt Synagogue. Remember, we saw the foundation of it. And then just a stone's throw away, literally, is Peter's home, a little to the south and about halfway to the, to the Sea of Galilee. All righty. So they went to Peter's home, and let's pick it up here in verse 14. When Yeshua came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. So this woman is quite sick and Jesus moves to heal this woman. Now all three of the Synoptic Gospels cover this event, but they use words that portray and develop the theme that each guide Gospel writer wants to portray, each theme that he finds important. So I'll go through the event in what I feel is the chronological order. I think you'll see it's very reasonable. The first step is rebuking in Luke 3, 439. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she immediately got up and waited upon them. So Luke is writing to the Greeks who are interested in the ideal man, excuse me, and so we have the ideal man rebuking that which is not ideal, this sickness. The next step is touching in Matthew 8, 15. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and waited on him. Now Jesus is the king, according to Matthew, and the king needs only to touch or to exhibit a mere gesture, and that's sufficient to get his orders carried out. So here he reaches out and touches her hand, and then he raises her up in Mark 131. And he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she waited on them. Now Mark's theme is Jesus the servant of the Lord, and so the servant now reaches out his hand to raise his mistress up. So you can see how the Synoptic Gospels all work together to expand a scene. And this scene of healing started with rebuking. Yeshua walked in, he rebuked that fever, he then reached out his hand and she reached out her hand toward him and they held hands and then he raised her up. And throughout this very, only a, it would probably only take a few seconds for this to happen, throughout this process the fever left her and she was totally healed. All right, let's move on to Mark chapter 1, verse 32. When evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. Well, word, get, word gets around mighty quick that P 
Peter's mother-in-law has been healed. But the people in Capernaum wait till after sunset to bring their ill and demon-possessed people to Yeshua. Now, why? Well, because the Pharisees taught that you can't be healed on the Sabbath. Come some other day, but don't come on the Sabbath to be healed. And so they waited until the sunset and the Sabbath had ended. Now, notice the distinction being between illness, physical illness, and demon possession. There's a big difference between physical sickness and demon possession. Saying that all sickness is caused by a demon is incorrect. Some afflictions are caused by demons, but not all, not all. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 41. Demons were coming out of many shouting, you are the son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be the Messiah. Well, as he casts out these demons, he rebukes the demons. Well, why? They're proclaiming the truth. He is the Son of God. Why would he rebuke them for that? Well, that's because demons don't make the best character witness. You don't want, Jesus didn't want a demon uh, promoting him. You know, just as you wouldn't want a serial killer on your job resume. You don't want a famous mafia gangster like Al Capone as a character witness. And neither does Jesus want those of the evil one to witness uh, for him. Let's move on to section 50, the tour of Galilee with Simon and others. This is covered in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, this is lesson three, page 38 at the top. So Yeshua begins another preaching tour. Here he's fulfilling the office of a prophet. Now, Yeshua holds three offices eternally, prophet, priest, and king. We'll look at the office when he functions in that office, the event, and where. Now he holds three eternal offices, but he does not function in all three offices simultaneously at the same time. He functions in them one at a time. For, exa for example, the office of prophet, he functioned in the past. The event was his three and a half year ministry, and that was on earth. The next eternal office that he holds is office of priest. He's functioning in that office at the present. He is our great high priest in heaven. And in the future, he'll be king. And he'll function in that office at the second coming on earth, back on earth with the messianic kingdom. So for right now, he's functioning as a prophet during his three and a half year ministry. Okay, let's pick it up in Mark chapter one, verse 35, his preparation for a preaching tour. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Yeshua got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded spot, and he was praying there. So he prays in preparation for what he's going to face on this preaching tour. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. So his, um, his preaching tour is discussed in as a threefold ministry. The place of the preaching tour is the synagogue. The content of the preaching tour is the good news about the kingdom, the messianic kingdom, and it's authenticated by the healing of sicknesses and the casting out of demons. Now, Matthew mentions the disease and sicknesses. Mark mentions the demons. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. So demons are mentioned as well in the parallel account. All right, let's pick it, let's pick it up in Matthew 4, 24. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering from various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. So the result of this preaching tour is great attention that gets beyond Galilee. It overflows the borders of Galilee into Syria into Gentile territory. And again, in Matthew 4, 24, note the biblical distinction between ailments. Five types of ailments are mentioned here, and demonization is only one form of ailment that we can suffer. We can also suffer from other infirmities caused by injury or disease, whatever. Okay, let's take a look at the map here. Here is Galilee. He's going throughout this region on a preaching tour and it, the news of him is spilling over, and it's even spilling over into the north, into Syria, which is, which is uh, Gentile territory. All right, let's move to section 51, the second call of the four. This is covered in Luke, 
This is lesson three, page 38 at the bottom of the page. So now in this section, we will witness the recall of four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Now, Andrew is not specifically, explicitly mentioned here, but remember that Andrew is Peter's brother. Andrew and Peter are almost always mentioned together. So I feel it's, it's reasonable to think that Andrew was affected by this call as well. So if you want to change your outline to read four disciples and add Andrew's name in there, that's fine. If you want to leave it at three, that's okay as well. Uh, your choice, your choice. But my preference is to, uh, is to think that Andrew was part of this call. Now the setting of the call is fishing. And this is in chapter five of Luke, verses one through five. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying on the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of, them, one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. <sighs> but I will do as you say and let down the net. <laughs> well, Peter basically is saying to Yeshua, look, we know more about fishing than you do. You're a carpenter by trade. We're fishermen by trade. We know all about fishing. However, he adds, but at your word, I'll let down the net. He's, he's learning obedience to Yeshua's authority. And here's a principle we need to emphasize, that obedience must overrule experience. Obedience must overrule our experience. Now, he does obey. And the result is that the nets split in verses six and seven. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so, they, so that they began to sink. Well, Peter's reluctance obedience is honored and honored super abundantly. Who knows more about fishing now, Yeshua or Peter? So Peter recognizes Yeshua's power and authority over nature. He realizes this guy controls the fish. I only try to catch them and I don't, don't do such a good job sometimes. Like last night, I didn't catch a thing, but he controls them. Now let's talk a little bit about standards of comparison. If you use a human standard of comparison, you will always find someone lower than you, we'll always find someone lower than ourselves to make us feel better, you know, kind of puff us up. I'm, I'm a better person than that person. I'm better at this than that person, whatever. We are not to compare ourselves to men. There's only one standard we compare ourselves to, and that's the gold standard. That's the Lord Jesus himself. Now, Peter does this. And when Peter does this, he recognizes who he is. He recognizes he is a sinful man. And we will do the exact same thing when we compare ourselves to the divine standard, the gold standard, Yeshua's character and nothing else. All right, let's move on to verse eight, Luke 5, eight. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Yeshua's feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Yeshua then says, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Now, I'd like you to turn to lesson three, page 39 at the top. Oh, excuse me, I didn't finish this. For amazement had seen him and his companions because of the catch of fish, which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, from now on you'll be catching men. And they brought their boats to land and they left everything and followed him. There we go, finished it all up. He says, follow me, and they become fishers of men. Now at this point, turn to the process of the call, lesson three, page 39 at the top. I'd like to uh, take a look at the process of calling these men to ministry. We'll look at the section in the harmony, the scripture, the type of call, the time of year, and the disciples involved. So we begin with section 31, 
in John 1, 35 through 51, and the type of call was the initial call, the an introduction to Jesus the Messiah. The time of year was before Passover in 26 AD. And the disciples involved were John, Andrew, Simon, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. We saw that earlier. Then an interval occurred. Jesus went to Cana with his five disciples. He's teaching them. He performed the first miracle. He returned for Passover, received much publicity for all that he did, cleaning, cleansing the temple and performing miracles. He talked with Nicodemus and told him he needed to be born again. He then passed through Samaria and the Samaritan woman and the, and the people in Sychar became saved. He, healing the, he healed the nobleman's son at a distance. He was in Cana, the, whole, the nobleman's son was in Capernaum. That must have been amazing news in Capernaum. That's probably why he was welcomed in Capernaum. He was then rejected in Nazareth and he moved to Capernaum. All right, let's move on. Then in section 47, Matthew 4 and Mark 1, we come to what we think is a part-time call. And this is one or two months later. Passover is in the spring. This is a little bit later than that. And the disciples are Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Then another interval, interval intervenes, and he uh, spends time in Capernaum teaching and, and gathers much publicity. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. We just saw that. He takes this preaching tour of Galilee and receives much, much publicity. Word is getting out about him, even up into Syria. Now we come to section 51 in Luke 5, 1 through 11, and this is the full-time call. Has six months or so have elapsed from the initial call. And this includes Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. So this is the recall of these disciples. So I want you to note the time between the first meeting, which was in before Passover in the spring, and the time of total commitment a number of months later, now in the summer or even later than the summer. So the call was not instantaneous. It appears, it appears that way if you read the Gospels individually. But when you read them in the harmony, you see that God prepared these men step by step by step by step to make this commitment to full-time ministry. And if God calls you to ministry, God will probably prepare you as well. Through these steps, maybe, maybe some other way, but he'll probably prepare you. And the result is that these men leave their business. They leave fishing behind, they make total commitment to following Yeshua, and they have no other source of in income but to only trust Yeshua for their livelihood. And you know, when you get into ministry, many times funds is the biggest issue. But if God calls you to full-time service, he will probably use the same process and take care of you. So he'll probably put you through an initial call. You'll have a ministry, a desire to serve in this ministry. You'll have a sense of desire. I, I wanna get involved in something like that. Then you'll probably have a part-time call. You'll get involved like a, a volunteer, something like that. And then you'll get a full-time call. You'll be hooked and you'll be eager to go full-time into ministry. That's what happened to me. And that very well may be what will happen to you. All right, it's time now for an application. We're in lesson three, page 40. And uh, the theme that I chose is obedience must overrule experience. Now the biblical application, the biblical material, First of all, John the Baptist's disciples, their experience. John is sent from God and is a prophet. And John says, follow Jesus. The result, disobedience for most. They stayed with John. A lot of them stayed with John. Obedience for some, the apostle John and Andrew. They left and they followed Yeshua. And John the Baptist would decrease, but Yeshua would increase. And the area here is the area of faith. Obedience must overrule experience in the area of our faith. Secondly, the Samaritan woman, her experience, prejudice against Jews. Jesus said, put away your prejudice, listen to me. And the result, obedience and salvation for her and many others. And the area here is your prejudice. Obedience must overrule experience in the area of our prejudice. Thirdly, we come to the nobleman, his experience. My son's gonna die. Jesus, believe without a sign. The result, obedience. The son was healed, he and his whole family were saved. And this is the area of health. So even in this area, obedience must overrule experience. 
Then the Nazarenes, their experience, this is only Joseph, the carpenter's son. This is not the Messiah. These are the people that lived in Nazareth. Jesus said, believe in me. The result was disobedience. There was a withdrawing of any revelation. Jesus left Nazareth and he set up a new headquarters in Capernaum. And so this, this time the area involved is family and friends. Obedience must overrule experience, even in the area of your family and friends. Finally, Peter, his experience. What does a carpenter know about fishing? We know all about it, but I'll obey. Jesus said, let down your nets, and Peter obeyed, and he received a call to full-time service. And this is the area of your career. Obedience, obedience must overrule experience, even in the area of your career. So let's get personal here. Now something come into your life where your experience says, I can't, it won't work. It can't be resolved, it's hopeless, it's impossible. And yet God's word provides a principle that applies to that situation. God says, obey me, what will you do? Remember, obedience overrules experience. Could this be in the area of your faith, your prejudices, your health, your family, your friends, your career? I don't know. Only you can answer that question. So write down the area where you are facing this principle today. And it may not be the uh, areas that I've just mentioned in the, uh, in the application. It may not be in those areas, it may be in a totally different area. But the principle would still apply. So write it down, write it down, and then go beyond the application to a plan of action. And ask yourself, what can you do in order to obey God in this area of your life? How can you obey God? All right, this brings us to lesson number four. We're in, still in session 12, but we're now entering lesson number four of the Jewish Life of the Messiah 2021 edition. So we're gonna pick it up in section 52, the cleansing of a leper followed by much publicity. This is covered by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And sections 52 and 53 must be taken together. If we can possibly run them together, we'll do, the, do so. Now, the, the um, section begins with leprosy. The section deals a lot with leprosy. And I've provided two articles at the end of the section for a detailed explanation of leprosy for you. So that's a crucial, crucial uh, ingredient in these sections. So let's begin in Luke chapter 5, verse 12. While he was in one of the cities, remember this is a preaching tour, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Yeshua, he fell on, down on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So this man is full of leprosy. He's covered with leprosy. The leprosy is fully developed. He's very, very sick. He's close to death. Now, leprosy was the only defilement possible by a living human body. In the Hebrew scriptures, in Tanakh, defilement came from a dead body, but in the case of leprosy, from a living person. Here's Leviticus 13, 45 and 46. As for the leper who has the infection, now these lepers became outcasts from society because they were living bodies, living people, and to touch one made one unclean. As for the leper who has an infection, his clothes shall be torn, his hair and his head shall be uncovered, and he shall, un he shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. So they had to be identified by their clothes and by their disheveled hair and their, and their uncovered head and their cry of unclean. They were definitely distinguished from anyone else around them. He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So there he is. He's an outcast from society. He had to keep everyone at a distance by calling unclean. He had to be quarantined, in other words. Now the Talmud brings us some insight on the fate of a leper. This is Sanhedrin 47a. As Rabbi Yochanan said, he healed the leprosy of Naaman, which is what? The equivalent of death. Leprosy was considered a death sentence, an eventual death sentence. Then from the Babylonian Talmud, 64, Nedarim 64b, it was taught, four are accounted as dead, a poor man, a leper. 
a blind person and one who is childless. Now he, now the rabbis focus in on the leper. A leper, as it is written, and Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, and this is ju their justification for calling leprosy a, um, a eventual de death sentence, let her not be as one dead. Let her not be as one dead. And uh, we'll, we'll share some from Dr. Edersheim in just a moment here. I want you to note though, before we get to Dr. Edersheim, that in the Old Testament, after Israel settles in the land, there's not a single case of a Jewish leper being healed. And yet two chapters, chapters 13 and 14 of Leviticus are devoted to instructions about what to do in the case of a healed leper. And these were instructions that were never implemented. So leprosy was so unique a disease, it was left out of rabbinical cures. It could not be cured, only God could cure leprosy. And that's what Dr. Edersheim is going to share with us out of Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. He writes, whatever remedies, medical, magical, or sympathetic, rabbinic writings may indicate for various kinds of disease, leprosy is not included in the catalog. They left aside what even the Old Testament marked as moral death by enjoining those so stricken to avoid all contact with the living and even to bear the appearance of mourners. Rabbinism confessed itself powerless in presence of this living death. The possibility of a cure is in every instance traced to the direct agency of God. There's your key. In truth, the possibility of any cure through human agency was never contemplated by the Jews. Joseph, Josephus speaks of it as possibly granted to prayer. Only God could cure leprosy. That's the first point we wanna note. Then we wanna look at the types of miracles. The rabbis divided miracles into types of miracles. This is lesson four, page three in the middle of the page. There were two types of miracles in rabbinic thinking. Number one, those anyone empowered by the Spirit of God could perform, you and me, anybody. And two, those miracles only the Messiah could do, messianic miracles. And there were three types of miracles only the Messiah would perform. The healing of a Jewish leper, casting out of demons of deafness and dumbness, and the healing of a man born blind. So these are three types of miracles only the Messiah would perform. So when these, when, 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 excuse me, when we see these miracles occur in the gospel, there's always a unique reaction in the context. Now why? Well, here's the rabbinic reasoning as I understand it. Number one, leprosy or, or these other ailments is incurable by man. Two, however, in the kingdom, all disorders and afflictions will be healed. And we get that from Isaiah 35, five and six, for example. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Number three, therefore, here's the conclusion. The Messiah will have to deal will have to heal all infirmities, including leprosy, when he arrives and institutes the kingdom. That's basically the rabbinic thinking. Now, what did the Torah say about leprosy? So we're now at the Torah's instruction regarding a healed leper, lesson four, page three, at the bottom. Now, this is a, this is a summary of the instructions in Leviticus 13 and 14. Number one, the healed leper comes to the priest and makes an initial offering of two birds. This is followed by seven days of full-scale investigation. How was he healed? What's the nature of the, of the leprosy, the skin disease? Was he really a leper? And there would be a written report of his leprosy on file. This priest declared that man a leper on this date. So they could check that as well. Three, if it was genuine leprosy and a genuine healing, a genuine healing had occurred, then on the eighth day, offerings would be made in the temple. There would be a trespass offering, a sin offering, a burnt offering, and a meal offering. Fourthly, the priest would apply the blood of the trespass offering to the cleansed leper, to the right ear, right thumb, and right big toe. This spoke of 
Uh, it's a picture of total cleansing. This spoke of total cleansing. It spoke of the entire man from top to bottom has been cleansed. Fifth, the priest would apply the blood of the sin offering to the cleansed leper, to the right ear, right thumb, and right big toe. This spoke of a return to service. He had been cleansed in the ear so he could hear God. He had been cleansed in the thumb, on the hand, to do the will of God. And he was cleansed on his foot, on the toe, to walk with God. And then there's an application of oil, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, recognition of God's involvement in the healing. In the history of Israel, these regulations had never been put into practice. There was no record of implementation in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, when Jesus heals the leper, what happens? We come to the Messiah's instructions to the man. This is Lesson 4, page 4, in the middle of the page. Luke 5, 12 and 13. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Yeshua, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. Well, the man recognizes Messiah's authority, but he wonders about the willingness of Messiah. And so Yeshua's touch is an act of love and an act of positive identification. This man was untouchable. He was an outcast. He might not have been touched for years. And the rabbis had some comments about this. Again, Dr. Alfred Edersheim shares, us some, shares with us some rabbinic comments about lepers. Their burdens were needlessly increased. No one was even to salute him. His bed was to be low, inclining towards the ground. If he even put his head into a place, it became unclean. No less a distance than four cubits, six feet, must be kept from a leper. Or if the wind came from that direction, a hundred were scarcely sufficient. Rabbi Meir would not eat an egg purchased in a street where there was a leper. Another rabbi boasted that he always threw stones at them to keep them far off while others hid themselves or ran away. Rabbinism even forbade him to wash his face. So that's some of the burdens the rabbis placed upon lepers. Let's take a look at Luke 5.14. Yeshua then says, And he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So this is the Messiah's instructions to the healed leper. He becomes a testimony to the priests. He has to go to the priests and show them and, come and claim that he was healed, healed of leprosy. And this would force the priests, led by the high priest, to begin a seven-day full-scale investigation into the nature of the, of the miracle. This is in obedience to Leviticus 13 and 14. They would find out that Yeshua performed the miracle. And according to Jewish theology, he was doing a miracle only the Messiah could perform. And again, what's the reasoning behind the claim? Remember this, leprosy is incurable by man. However, in the kingdom, all orders, disorders and afflictions will be healed. The blind, the deaf, the lame, the mute, Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Therefore, the Messiah will have to heal all infirmities, including leprosy, when he arrives and institutes the kingdom. In the kingdom, all diseases are going to be cured. Well, how did Yeshua respond to this type of reasoning? Well, he responded po uh, positively in the, in the um, interaction with John the Baptist. John, now when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Messiah, he sent word by his disciples and said to, that, said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. In other words, compare what you hear and see to the scriptures. The blind receive sight, the blame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them, the Messiah is here, all infirmities are being healed. You're correct, John the Baptist, you're correct. This is what the Messiah will do. Now, what's your decision? Who am I? So Yeshua is claiming to be the Messiah by performing this miracle of healing the leper. 
He's forcing the Jewish leaders to come to a decision regarding his claim and his person, just like he, he's forcing John the Baptist to make a responsible decision of faith. And he's, he also forces you and me to make a responsible decision of faith. The scriptures say this is what the Messiah will do. Jesus did it. Who is the Messiah? Is he the Messiah? Make your responsible decision. I've told you to look at the prophecies, look at the life of Jesus, and make a decision. That's the process he forces us to go through. Luke 5.15, but the news about him was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. So news of this messianic miracle spreads like wildfire. This guy is even performing messianic miracles. And now the Messiah goes to prayer again in verse 16. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Why is he praying here? He's preparing for the next event. Now before we go to the next event, let me say one more thing about the relationship between leprosy and the Messiah. An anti-missionary once challenged the Messiahship of Yeshua by the following charge. He said, Jesus could not have been pure, thus sinless, because he touched leprous and unclean dead bodies. In touching the leper, he became impure under the Mosaic law. Therefore, he did not perfectly keep the Mosaic law, and he cannot be the Messiah. In other words, Yeshua's association with leprosy, the fact that he touched a leper, disqualified him from the Messianic office. Sounds intimidating, doesn't it? Well, what would be a relevant response to this charge? Well, Hadavar's response is on Lesson 4, page 5 in the middle. The fact that Yeshua touched a leper and unclean body does not disqualify him from Messiahship. This is especially true in light of the rabbinic doctrine called the leper Messiah, taken from Isaiah 53. It's a messianic section. Contact with leprosy, in fact, was a requirement for being the Messiah. It's an authenticating, authenticating qualification rather than a disqualification, according to Isaiah 53, 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him, what, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. That word stricken is very important. In the Moody Bible commentary, for example, you read the word stricken, meaning to smite with disease for sin, was used when both Miriam and Uzziah were stricken with leprosy for sin. So there the word stricken is associated with leprosy. But it doesn't stop there, folks. In the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 98b, we read, what is his, the Messiah's name? The rabbis said his name is the leper scholar, as it is written. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God, and afflicted. See that the word smitten is associated with leprosy. So the rabbis associate the Messiah with leprosy and with Isaiah 53:4 that as a messianic section and the word smitten with leprosy. They associate the Messiah with leprosy, Isaiah 53 with the Messiah, it's a messianic passage and the word smitten with leprosy. You see the rabbis interpreted Isaiah 53:4 as associating the Messiah with leprosy. Association with leprosy is not a disqualification. Now, in addition, there's no record of a genuine leopard being, leper being healed by man. A number of lepers were healed. Moses, Exodus 4, Miriam, Numbers 12, Naaman, 2 Kings 5. But they were all healed by the direct hand of God. Now, Yeshua touched a leper but it was an act of healing, not defilement. The implication of this healing act, since there is no record of a leper being healed by a man, and since there's no biblical record of a treatment or a remedy, then the implication is that Yeshua is God in a human body. The implication is that God himself reached out and healed this man. There's no disqualification from the office of Messiahship here. Now, in his book, The Rabbinic Messiah, Reverend Tom Huckle brings to light another rabbinic teaching that associates the cleansing of the Messiah, the cleansing of leprosy with the Messiah. There, I got it right. It associates the cleansing of leprosy with the Messiah. I'm getting excited here, aren't I? All right, Babylonian Talmud, 
Sanhedrin 97a to Leviticus 13, 13 associates leprosy with sin and states, the son of David will not come until the whole world is converted to the belief of the heretics. Rabbah said, what verse proves this? It's all turned white, he is clean. He's quoting Leviticus 13, 13. And a footnote in the Talmud explains the rabbinic idea. What was the rabbi thinking? This refers to leprosy. A white swelling is a symptom of uncleanness. Nevertheless, if the whole skin is so affected, it is declared clean. So here too. When all are heretics, it's a sign that the world is about to be purified by what? The event of the Messiah, the advent of the Messiah. Again, leprosy and the Messiah are connected. The purification from leprosy, both spiritual and physical, is associated with the coming of the Messiah. Then in the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 98a, Rav Joshua ben Levi met Elijah. Elijah the prophet, he's the forerunner of the Messiah. He met Elijah and then asked him, when will the Messiah come? Elijah responds, go and ask him. And then Rabbi Joshua speaks up, well, by what sign shall I recognize him? How am I going to recognize the Messiah? And Elijah says, He's sitting among the poor lepers. And notice how he stands out among the poor lepers. All of them untie them, meaning their wounds, all at once and rebandage them together. So the average leper is untying all his, all his wounds on his skin at once and then rebandaging them all at once, two, two processes. Whereas he, the Messiah now, here's how the Messiah is going to stand out, he unties and rebandages each separately before treating the next. Thinking, here's the thinking of the Messiah, should I be wanted? It being time for my appearance as the Messiah, I must not be delayed through having to bandage a number of sores. So here the Messiah sits among the lepers waiting for his advent to Israel and he is a leper himself. Conclusion. The association with leprosy and the healing of leprosy is a qualification for messiahship, not a disqualification. The suffering messiah is associated with leprosy. So touching and healing this leper did not disqualify Yeshua in the slightest. All right, now we're in lesson four, page seven. And there is a chart there one of my students made. I thought she did a great job, so I included the chart in, uh, in your notes there. There's one correction, however, I ran across. In, uh, under number two, there's no biblical record of a leper being healed by man. The first verse mentioned there is Exodus 5, 6, and 7. That should be corrected to Exodus 4, Exodus 4, 6, and 7. Okay, Exodus 4, 6, and 7, not Exodus 5, 6, and 7. So I think that um, I think that chart uh, we'll, you'll enjoy that chart. It uh, continues on to page eight, and then starting on page eight and on to page nine are the articles about leprosy for you. And uh, so we'll pick it up. We'll pick it up uh, next section uh, with um, section fifty-three. Yes, we're in section fifty-two now. We'll pick it up in section fifty-three. And I see I'm down to less than two minutes, so my timing is not too bad this session, is it? All right, thanks so much for being our students. We've got a lot to share in the next section, especially about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Uh, who is he? Uh, you'll be fascinated to learn more about him. He was a rabbi who questioned Yeshua when Yeshua was teaching and rejected in Capernaum. He must have been there. And as I go through the information about his life, I think you'll agree with me. All right, I think we're in for a very interesting time next session. I trust that the, our studies in the Gospels are a blessing to your heart. I want to thank you for being our students. See you next session. Lahit, lahit. That's short for lahit ra'ot. Bye-bye.